Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome to the New York Public Library. I'm Faye Rosenfeld, and I am the Vice President of Public Programs here at the NYPL. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we are thrilled to have you with us at Live from NYPL. It is my honor to introduce tonight's program with Joshua Cohen, Rivka Galchen, and Ruby Namdar. They're here to discuss the legacy of A.B. Yehoshua, the great Israeli novelist, humanist, and outspoken peace activist who died in June of this year. I'm gonna say more about our speakers in just a moment, but first, tonight's event is the first in a series celebrating a milestone anniversary here at the New York Public Library, the 125th anniversary of the Dorot Jewish Division. Established in 1897, just two years after the creation of the New York Public Library itself, the Durot Division is the oldest public collection of Jewish research materials in America and one of the most important collections of Hebraica and Judaica in the world. Its holdings encompass the full range of Jewish thought, culture, and expression in all Jewish languages, from precious rarities dating back to the 13th century to Yisker books documenting the destruction of Eastern European Jewish communities during the Holocaust, to modern theater and music scores, and much, much more. The Dorot Reading Room, known in the early days as the Jewish Room, was from its inception a gathering place, an intellectual haven for Jewish writers, scholars, and ordinary readers, many of whom, many of, many of them, recent immigrants fleeing persecution who would often come to this magnificent building after long days of work at factories and sweatshops. Legendary figures from Isaac Besheva Singer to E.L. Doctorow to Eliezer Ben Yehuda, the founder of the modern Hebrew language, spent time there. In the case of Ben Yehuda, using it as a place to write and think and meet with fellow writers after he first arrived in America. In the case of Ben Yehuda, using an adjacent office from 1914 to 1918 to complete research on what would become his magnum opus, the Dictionary of the Hebrew Language. The pivotal role of the New York Public Library in supporting research that led to the creation of modern Hebrew has only recently been uncovered thanks to the exceptional work of our Dorot curator, Dr. Ludmila Sholokhova. Mila helped piece the story together and even identified the exact room uh, just down the hall where Ben Yehuda worked after he was brought to safety in New York by American Jewish philanthropists following the outbreak of the First World War. It's truly an incredible discovery. And if you want to learn more about the history of Dvorot, then I invite you to come back here on December 14th when we're going to have a panel discussion um, examining the history and the future of the Jewish division. So um, there's information about that in your programs. Um, and if you didn't have time to check out the one night only display of extraordinary materials that Mila uh, pulled from the collections for tonight, uh, please do that after the event. Mila's gonna be outside um, after the program is over. Of course, all of this is just one example of the impact that the New York Public Library has had and continues to have on culture, language, and literature around the world. An impact that turned out to be particularly consequential in the context of Israeli identity and Jewish destiny. So it's very fitting that to celebrate this incredible history, we're joined at live from NYPL by three highly acclaimed contemporary Jewish writers in honor of one of the greatest authors of modern Hebrew literature, who we had the privilege of hosting here at live back in 2011, A.B. Yehoshua. Rivka Galchin is a staff writer at The New Yorker, the author of two novels, most recently, Everyone Knows Your Mother is a Witch, published in 2021, as well as a short story collection, an essay collection, and a novel for children. And she was also a fellow right here at the Library Center for Coleman, uh, Library's Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. Joshua Cohen is the author of six novels, four short story collections, and one collection of essays and criticism. His most recent novel, The Netanyahu's, won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2022. And our moderator, Israeli-American writer Ruby Namdar, is the author of two novels, Chaviv, which won the Ministry of Culture's Award for Best First Publication, and The Ruined House, which won the Sapir Prize, Israel's most prestigious literary award. If you have a New York Public Library card, which I'm sure, of course, you all do, uh, you can check out their books uh, right at any branch or also online using our Simply E app. Before I bring our guests on stage, I want to tell you about one more occasion that we're celebrating this evening. Tonight is the kickoff of Jewish Book Month, 
an annual celebration of Jewish literature that takes place, place, takes place the month before Hanukkah and has been celebrated by libraries and uh, literary Jewish organizations since 1925. Jewish Book Month is sponsored by our wonderful partner this evening, uh, the Jewish Book Council. The Book Council also holds Jewish literary programs, publishes a journal, and presents the National Jewish Book Awards, of which both Joshua Cohen and A.B. Hoshua have been recipients. I hope you'll visit their website to learn more about their programs and their resources. A huge thank you to Naomi Firestone Teeter and Evie Sapphire Bernstein and the entire JBC team for their help with tonight's program. And a special thank you as well to Yair Kedar and Neta Rosen from the Israeli Consulate for helping us secure film clips that you're about to see. Tonight was made possible by the Celebrate 350 Foundation by Celeste Bartos, Manazis Bahani Bartos, and Adam Bartos, and by all of you, our wonderful supporters and friends near and far. Thank you for supporting live from NYPL and helping us bring all of this fabulous programming to you for free. Our guests are gonna speak for around 45 minutes. Uh, then they'll take questions, so please, if you have any questions, write them on the note cards that you have on your seats, or if you're watching us online, just drop them into the chat or send us an email at publicprograms at nypl.org. They'll get to as many questions as they can. Now, please welcome Ruby Namdar, Joshua Cohen, and Rivka Galchin. Good evening. Hi, everybody. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to, uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, first of all, it's really, um, it's, it's nice to, uh, to take a moment and appreciate the fact that we're here together, like seeing each other in the eyes of the flesh and inhaling each other's presence. This is not to be taken for granted. I, I know that I missed it a lot. And it's just amazing to be back, back in life again. So, back to life. And thank you to all, to our many gracious hosts. Uh, we are here to um, celebrate and, uh, and delve into a legacy <laughs> of, um, of a very complex, interesting, and uh, unusual, right? A, a literary figure that um, I made a mark, a big mark, on all of us, and in many ways. And uh, I would like us to discuss these ways in, uh, uh, you know, the literary, but also the ideological and also personal uh, legacy that Aleph Bet Yoshua, or Bully, as everybody now, you know, whoever once like saw him in the street, everybody's like saying, oh, Bully said, Bully had left on us. Uh, maybe we should start by, uh, by the first um, short clip from a, an amazing documentary uh, done by Yair Kedar, the, the wonderful Yair Kedar, uh, that spent the last few months of Yoshua's life with him developed a very close and, uh, and really interesting relationship. He brought out a tender and, uh, and con a, a more ponderous side from Yoshua than most of us knew and, and met. And a very beautiful, very moving documentary that I really recommend. Uh, I know the Hebrew, Ken Arayon Acharon Shal Aleph Bet Yoshua, the Aperik Acharon, Aleph Bet Yoshua's last chapter. Let's start with a, a small excerpt, and then let's, let's go there. Please. I'm in 1936. In Jerusalem, which was very strong, of course, in the British Empire, my father worked in the local government. הוא היה מתורגמן, הוא ידע שפות וידע במיוחד ערבית וידע גם אנגלית וככה הוא היה מתרגם את החוקים המנדטוריים וכל הצד המזרחני אצלו 
מאוד היה אהוב עליי. נורא אהבתי שהוא היה לפעמים מביא ערבים הביתה. מן אלבדיהי באני תעקבתו ותטבעתו באהתמאם זאידן כל מה כתבה אבני אל כתב אברהם יהושע או כמה הוא מערוף לעין קורע אל יהוד ולערב בלכב אלף בית יהושע. אימא שלי הייתה אישה חזקה מאוד, וגם הרביצה לי. והרבה פעמים היא הייתה אומרת, אני אעכה אותך, אז מה עשית? וכל הזמן אמרתי, תקיא אותי עכשיו, ולא רציתי ללכת עם המכה שתבוא. היא הייתה גם בודדה, בודדה, כלומר, לא הייתה לה משפחה מסביב. אבי הביא אותה ב-32, איש... עשיר ממרוקו, שיש לו 11 ילדים, נכדים, עוזב את כל משפחתו, לוקח את שתי בנותיו שעדיין לא נישאו, בא לכאן ב-1932, כאשר יש כאן 300 אלף יהודים בסך הכל, רובם אשכנזים, הוא בא מתוך אמונה בציונות. אין התרפקות על הילדות. הילדות הייתה באיזשהו מקום מאבק. יכול להיות שגם היחסים בין הוריי, היה לזה מתיחות, לא הייתה הרמוניה מספיק. געגועים, לא יודע. אני, אני לא אדם של נוסטלגיה. אוקיי. זה בעצמו כל כך רגע, ויש כל כך הרבה להתגעת. That, uh, that image of the, of the pipe, you know, that, that famous pipe that was for a long time the, the symbol of the early young Yehoshua is where my relationship started with him. And I, I, for me, he, he, I came of age when his star was rising. So, so for me, his, that, that uh, figure, that uh, persona, that he created of the worldly, very sophisticated. The pipe suggested something. A pipe is never a pipe, as we all know, right, Magritte? <laughs> um, and, um, and in provincial, wonderful provincial Israel, actually, a, a, it was a statement of something. And then there was the lover, and then I learned about the short stories. So there was a persona that was larger than the actually the sum of the words of the, of the literature, something about the persona that he created and the tone of the literature uh, suggested a new possibility, a new identity. And, and this is where I first met A.B. Oshua, is the pipe, the lover, and then the short stories. And I'm very curious to know about your, your relationship with his work, persona, Where did it start? What stuck to memory? How, how did he become part of your life as writers? As you know, I actually mm -hmm. remember this so well. Um, I found um, A.B. Yehoshua in, in uh, my bathroom in Norman, Oklahoma, on the floor. And uh, <laughs> I mentioned that because I came from a, a family where nobody read books. And in fact, I remember like it was a common thing to say, remind me, remind me, because I was interested in books. What Wait, you mean the book, not a book? I bully. mean the book. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> that would no, be an Sometimes it's story. important to That's clarify things, story. right? Yeah, he's been found in many bathrooms. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he, but, uh, and was planning on more. <laughs> no, but what, what was important to me, so I, I, I grew up so far away um, from the, this world, and yet at the same time I knew that this was the world of, of my parents, this sort of, and especially this world where everyone spoke six languages. Every, you know, my mother, I knew, on the one hand, I knew my mother spoke Arabic, I knew, and Hebrew, and Turkish, and English, and every, you know, and French, and all of these things. That's that world, that was his yeah. world. Um, so that world was on the one hand present, but completely imaginary. And there was like no interest in art in my, in my childhood or life, except for this one thing. And uh, so I find this book and my mom, mother, and, and people used to, I remember my mother used to say, remind me, what is fiction, nonfiction? What, what's the difference? <laughs> like it was just like a thing. And, uh, but 
she fell in love with the books. She's like, the only books I will read are Olive Bed Yehoshua and Guy de Maupassant, which was like the first thing translated um, when she was a child. It was like May one I of the only the books language? available. What and language? She, she read it in Hebrew. It was one of in the Hebrew. first things translated into Hebrew. Um, and so I always had this like moment in my head, like, I don't know who this man is, but he can even reach my mother, who has no interest <laughs> in this world. Something about him touches her heart. So uh, years later, when I was 17 and in Israel by myself, of course, the book I read was The Lover. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's the place he had in my landscape. Thank you. Uh, yeah, when I was growing up in Israel in the 60s, he was very important. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you I just said it. You yeah, just, just yeah, said yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, um, I came at him from the other side, and uh, the side where he, for people of of my generation growing up, especially in in the Northeast around New York, you know, he's the the, the sort of Hobbit-looking guy who comes to actually this place. You know, the bigger hall. They gave him the bigger room, mm. right? No. And, you know, and, you know, it was like, you know, Atem Tumtamim, Bogdim, Goyim, right? Screaming at American Jews. They don't speak Hebrew. They don't know enough about whatever. And, and, that, and that it's our fault mm -hmm. that something is going to happen. I don't know what. He was never really clear on what. No. You know, Israel already didn't acknowledge that it had a nuclear program, but it had a nuclear program at the time. So I don't know how we were going to cause anything. Right, uh, but but he was sure we were, mm -hmm. and um, and that was the rhetoric. I mean, I remember reading in the you know in 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 in, in the Jewish press, you know, guy who's you know whose last name was my you know the name I had to use when I was in in, in yeshiva for you know Yeshua, yells at people in New York, <laughs> and uh, and then it you know there was always like guy comma, novelist, you know? They never say anything about his novels, they just reported yeah. his yelling. And, um, and so I had a, 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 a deep antipathy and mistrust, you know? Why would I, why, really? He seems to not like a lot of the things that I like. So I, I, I don't think I'll like him, yeah. right? And, um, and then, uh, but, but he was right about one thing, I was stupid. My Hebrew was okay, but I was stupid, right? And I didn't realize that that's sort of what a novelist has to do. They just, you know, like the, the, these voices come to them, they do things that are a little bit crazy, and they channel different characters because the person I found in his books, and I began with a lover, um, uh, feeling as myself at the age of 13 or 14, like a lover. <laughs> um, and I, I um, and it was very strange to me that the same person could have those modes. And so I, I, I would like to say that that opened me up to this idea of um, someone, you know, containing contradictions. I think I was probably too young to fully understand that. But certainly the, the taste of, of, of a man who contained a lot of internal debate and struggle and contradiction um, mm. remained with me and was confirmed by reading, uh, uh, you know, continuing on reading his books. Yeah. It's interesting that you're pointing out to the to the difference in voices, and this is one of the things that uh, that this documentary made me uh, like again very shockingly aware of is how 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 big the difference was between his his per persona of the everyday and between the voice that came out in his novels. It was very baffling. Hmm. I mean, he's. His novels were very um, uh, sensitive, and there was something uh, uh, soft and almost, I, I dare to say, feminine in the voice. And he loved to he loved to write about women, and he loved writing women, f mm -hmm. female voice. And then in 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 his public persona, he was like a caricature of a mansplainer. It was like <laughs> it was really, and I'm gonna soon tell you like some horror stories about our first, <laughs> our first meetings. Uh, we 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 just have to warn: this is not going to be like oh, let's all sit and compete with who's gonna eulogize him. Yeah. I mean, he was a very complex character, yeah. and he loved being a complex character. And by God, we're going to yeah, go yeah, yeah, yeah. to every bit of that. Uh, Sure. Complexity, because for me, he's going to be sitting here, smiling a big smile, 
And then he's going to be like, ah, you really thought I would buy this? I mean, he would not. He wasn't looking for people to idolize him. Um, there's something about the, the, strange, um, the strange discrepancy between his voice in the, in the everyday and between his literary voice that, also, um, that can also be said about his writing. Mm. I feel that he was very prolific and very inconsistent. Yeah. It's and and I want to know what your thoughts are about this and 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 about him and also how do you think about it in, about your own work? I mean, does it reflect? Do you identify? Are you yeah. so let's let's start about his and then I please. Are you saying you feel like his persona was bombastic and his work was? Soft I and would, flexible. I, I'm on gonna, average. I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> okay. cause more trouble and okay. even say crude and bombastic. Yeah. And then the the work at times was very subtle, and at times was not that bombastic but less subtle. Mm. And there's ver there's varying voices and there's varying quality to the work. Mm -hmm. Do you find it? Is it something that you? Yeah, very much so. I mean, am I? Go yeah. for it. Please. Oh, I mean, I, I, I think that um, I always, you know, I don't have any interesting stories about Yoshua. By the time I met him, he was, you know, falling apart, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a, a, a quad cane and, um, uh, and a, a helper who he tried to make me believe that he was also sleeping with. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that was like two and a half or three weeks before he died, by the way. This was like, this was May. Um, and so, but uh, uh, I will say that, that the one thing that I wanted to ask him, and I realized that maybe he wasn't, you know, you have to ask, your, if you have a question for someone, it's not enough. You have to find the right moment to ask. And what I really would always wanted to know about him was what he felt um, in terms of his own, the, the public burden on his shoulders. Mm -hmm. He's someone who, um, you know, I, I love telling you this. I love in front of audience. I'm telling, like, let me tell you what you already know much better than I do. Okay, you know? <laughs> so it's, you know, he, he, he is a stylist, or he, would, he wants to be a stylist. He's a self-consciously stylish writer mm -hmm. early on in a language that is, um, that has a very deep poetry register and a f much cruder prose register. And it's finding its feet, prose-wise. Uh -huh. It's also in a uh, using models that are all from other languages, the Russians, French. Um, it's also in a place where if you were a writer, especially of his generation, and you're published and you have readers, you're enormously important. You're politically, you are made by default, you're politically important. Yeah. Yizhar was in the Knesset. Right? You know, I, I love that you, the facts of how many people went to Bialik's funeral. Every time I check that fact, it just gets bigger by like, you know, yeah. 20,000, right? More people went to Bialik's funeral than were in Israel. And the Yeshuv is getting smaller. Yeah, the Yeshuv is getting smaller. Right. And, and, um, and uh, the amount of, I think, the, the number of eyeballs on you, the amount of just people watching, listening, and then the way in which he represented certain communities and the way in which uh, certain communities saw him as a certain road toward the Ashkenaz world, yeah. um, and, and the world of you know, institutional literature insofar as it existed at that point, it must have been crushing pressure. And I think that a lot of mm. um, the inconsistency in his work, and also the inconsistency, or let's say the inconstancy, to be kinder, of his personality, had to do with having to deal with those pressures, which I, you know, I find it difficult to do anything this morning when I have to show up here, yeah. right? But when you have, you know, radio and TV asking your opinion when a prime minister sneezes, I don't know how you write a paragraph. Yeah. And I think it might be, to my mind at least, I mean, and I don't know enough about, um, about all the world literatures, it really might be this, he is of the last generation of that type of importance. And, um, and he wore it sometimes uncomfortably. Hmm. 
It's interesting. I feel that he really coveted that. He was very enamored with this position. Right. And also uh, constantly yelled at, because that's what he did, at the younger generation for not doing that. Right. And what kind of authors are you if you don't take a public stance about yeah, yeah, everything? Yeah. And you're betraying the vocation of an author. And uh, we're going to get to that about mm. politics and writing and yeah. how do they mix in your work. But... Um, but I felt like for if I was to be a, to 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 counter what you're saying in a way is I felt like it was his his evil inclination. I felt like he coveted this. Right. And maybe I mean you're you're presenting the the, the burden like Bialik's famous yeah. whiny poem. Oh, what do you want from me? Right. The right. burden of your love. But Bialik was constantly, if somebody, if Bialik didn't get love yeah. at any given moment, the world would come to an end. Right, or like the famous story, you know, where Agnon, and then they put the sign up on the street that says, quiet, you know, an author is working. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, and the idea that, you know, and I, I can imagine that he coveted that because that is from an older generation, yeah. right? But the farther you get from Yoshua's generation, you know, it's not like they collapse together, but that world of even thinking that that public stance is possible is so foreign. It is foreign. It is foreign, and it's, um, I'm also asking myself the question, is, is this what we aspire for today yeah. as writers? Well, that's why like, I think literature is so much better than an opinion piece. I actually think <laughs> opinion pieces are the lowest form of writing that exists. <laughs> and... Um, and, and to be coerced again and again, maybe by choice because it somehow massages the ego or maybe by burden because historically that was a moment when that was what was expected of him. He, you know, it's, it, 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 whether, whether it's uncomfortable or comfortable, like he's in that position again and again. It's interesting to compare him to someone like Davi Grossman, who of course paid the, 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 the worst price mm -hmm. ever um, sort of for being an Israeli citizen. Um, and, and the way that they both feel an obligation to participate as citizens, but you feel that David Grossman isn't participating as a citizen writer, he's participating as a citizen, yeah. or at least for me. Um, but, but I will say um, that I never knew him personally. I'm sure, I'm sure like almost every writer I've ever met, he was a little bit of a disappointment. <laughs> so I'm sure that that's Fuck the case. You. What can we yeah, say? What, what can we say? Except we try so guys. hard. Yeah, except for yeah. these two guys. <laughs> But what I actually like about the fact that his work is uneven is I've always associated that unevenness with a kind of humility. Like, it's this sense of, like, is this novel good? Is it bad? Who am I to say? I don't know. I just wrote another one. He was prolific. You know, there's something humble about being prolific rather than being like, every 15 years, I will let you see into my psyche. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I like that. I know you're such a positive person. That's I'm yes. not a positive, but <laughs> I, I'm that way. But I, that's I such I a positive, it. generous take yeah. on on a Why didn't me? on prolific. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, but but I, I, I mean, there's something if you watch this 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 documentary, right? Which I say it's, it's part of a, a whole series, right? It's, it's yeah, yeah. Ivrim, Ivrim, right? Yeah. And, and which is an amazing. Series. And he's the only living guy, though, yeah. who's in the the in the series, though. It follows how he slowly becomes a non-living yeah, yeah. guy. He's moving into the the, <laughs> dead, the dead poet. <laughs> exactly, but but the the one of the things that is very apparent in it, um, and is you know people are always like you know calling him and knocking on his door and saying, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? And I think that's also how you become prolific. He he tells himself, they need this from me. <laughs> uh -huh. They want like you know it's like when he has that he has that he has this sigh when he when uh, the phone rings and then when he puts down the phone. That is the most dramatic stage sigh. Yeah, you know, you, it's the I most it's it's the it. most like <laughs> Yiddish sigh from a Mizrahi that I've ever heard. But it's like, uh, you know, Why and do it's they like, want from right? Me? What do they want from another book? You know, and then it's like, I'm sorry, I have to do this, and like I must, you know, my public needs me, and and I think that that also, you know, I mean, I think writers have a lot of different um, survival mechanisms, and I think that this is, mm. you know, maybe his way of you know, of generating the energy to make something. Yeah. You know? I mean, if the, if the country needs a book of mine, <laughs> I'll do it. The, the country, yeah, 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 the yeah. world is waiting. They're right outside the window. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the funny thing is, I was just sitting with, a, with, a, with my good friend Maya Arad, the Israeli, the famous Israeli novelist, yeah. and she said, we were having a conversation about 
how much I hate writing, how much she loves writing, you know, the <laughs> yeah. things. Lunch, you know, yeah. we call it lunch. And, um, and she said, I said, oh, I can't wait to retire. All I wanted ever to do is to tend bar. Yeah. And what, what, I mean, enough. And she wait, said, you no. said that or she yeah, said that? Yeah, I said you that. Said that. Because okay. that's all, what I really always wanted to do is yeah. tend bar. But it is and slow Josh, bar. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, 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 yeah. Like one of those Irish dilapidated yeah, 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 places. Yeah, yeah. And, so a money laundering uh, yeah, place. Not, none yeah, yeah, of yeah. that very yeah, yeah, energetic yeah, 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 yeah. thing. And, uh, and she said, no, I want to be like bully. I want to like, mm -hmm. you know, they will find me dead face down on my, on my keyboard. Right. And I said, I, I, it's like I, I, I can't deal with this model. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that it wasn't, I'm going to say it now, and I'm sorry, but it's in keeping with, with mm -hmm. your show's uh, legacy of, of very honesty to a fault. Mm -hmm. I think it hurt his career. Right. I think this prolificity, is that how you say it? Prolificacy? I think so. Prolif Carolyn told me that this is not a word, but yeah. I insisted on using it anyway. <laughs> Being very prolific, a hurt, <laughs> hurt <of> his <laughs> legacy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hurt his legacy. I feel that um, the, 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 the same dynamics that you're describing yeah. as generosity and you're saying, uh, I felt like it was yet an mm -hmm. evil inclination, like an inability mm -hmm. to curb yourself and to say adkan mm -hmm. until a certain moment. And then in this documentary that is kind of a ghost entity in this room right now, mm -hmm. he says, he looks at some later text and he says, oh, I was a better writer once. And I'm sorry to say it, he's right. Oh, okay, so I'm, I'm going I'm to jump in. So, um, and, and, and I'm go. I, I'm going to take your job for a second uh, and you. ask you a question. Please, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, you know, um, your position in Israeli literature is fascinating to me. Thank you. And, um, and I, I, we can talk later about whether all of these decisions are, uh, how many of them are accidents and how many of them are conscious, or how many of them you acknowledge as being conscious or not, right? But, um, but one of the things that um, I wonder, first of all, um, you have a very, especially for the generation you're from, a particularly rich style and a very particular music in Hebrew. Um, do, uh, do you feel like the distance that you have being here allows you to have that style? And secondarily, what does, your, what does that style have to do with his, because I know that he wrote in many registers, mm -hmm. but the young Yoshua was revolutionary yeah. for, for Hebrew prose. And, um, and what did you really on a technical get from him? So, thank you for this question. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. uh, being, being away definitely allows me mm -hmm. to, be, to have this kind of Archimedic point outside of the Israeli condition right. that he was the embodiment of. So in a way, by, by moving away from being bullied, I could do what, I, what I'm doing now, uh, which is being a Hebrew author without necessarily being Israeli at all given moments, and, and to write a maybe Jewish literature or whatever literature it is without constantly dealing with Hamatzav, the condition, which I feel took over Bully's work and not always in a great way. And, uh, and yes, the... The Lover in itself was, was, um, was a very shocking, I, I mean it in the best yeah. way possible. When, when The Lover came out, I have in Hebrew, and I was very, it was very strange for me to see that he didn't speak about it a lot, and nobody else speaks about The Lover. But The Lover is the book that put Aleph Bet Yoshua on the big stage. People appreciated the short stories, which were, in my opinion, masterpieces mm. of the Hebrew literature, modern Hebrew literature. But the lover put him on the map, really, made him like one of the big stars. And yes, the, the lover had a, a big influence on me. There was not only the style and the, the, um, the great attention to language, but there was the position. He, he, was, he was the opposite of the kind of moldy, stale position that Afka is hard embodied of this, like very sabra, very, it went with the pipe. He brought in a certain cosmopolitan charm. Yeah. And it's so funny to think about Bully 
as the one who brought cosmopolitan charm to Israeli culture, yeah. but he did right. for a while. And I feel that then, I feel that almost the, the love of the audience, as you, as you put it very well, kind of hugged him and, in my opinion, dragged him down and, and inside like a bear hug. Yeah. And yes, the early Yoshua is a big influence on me. Yeah. And I felt in ways a little injured by the, by the slow deterioration and the insisting on writing and writing and writing out of a sense of duty. But it was hard for me, almost as if I see a father figure, right. not not knowing when to shut up, in a way. Yeah. Get off uh, the court, retire. Yeah. And <laughs> how, uh, uh, do yeah. you guys think about it? Like, is there a time for us to just shut up and get off the stage, or are we gonna just die face down on the on the keyboard? But what is it about the lover that is so much more powerful to you than? I imagine you like the tunnel, but not as much, or that you c connect to Mr. Money, but not so. I, like, what was special about that book? I mean, I do think there's a special power in your early work. There's like, yeah. there's no getting around that, and that, yeah. there's a moment when you're writing privately. That early work is a private work that happens to be read by other people, and you'll never replicate that again. So I'm just wondering what it, what is it that you've, I understand that his persona was kind of like not of interest to you and, and you felt like reduced him intellectually, but what is it on the, on the page that makes that novel so much more powerful for you? I think it's exactly what you said. I think there was a certain freshness and it was also maybe a self-fascination. He was fascinated with himself. He was fascinated with his word, fascinated with that persona because th there was a lot of persona behind the lover. Mm. And later, the, a, so a, a form of like, almost like stylistic, not stylistic, but a, a, a kind of arthritis kind of set in. Yeah. You kind of knew, you knew the voice that's gonna speak. And I think about it a lot when I think of my work and the work of my peers, of knowing, is it, is it my model to keep writing and writing and be very prolific? Is this like something I, I value? I know I don't, and I'm curious. I mean, I think about, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I, I think a lot about, uh, especially because, you know, we were looking at that, at that documentary before, you know, getting together tonight is, you know, here's this guy who gets a cancer diagnosis, right, in the, in, in, in the, in the documentary. He has the, the, the camera crew goes with him to, to the, the oncologist who's explaining to him how the surgery is gonna be done, right, and then, about, I don't know, you don't know exactly when it is time, but in the documentary right after that, he's meeting with um, um, secondaries, the high school students, and talking about uh, the occupation, right? So it's like, if you knew that you were gonna die in a year, mm -hmm. how much time are you gonna spend with high school students talking about the occupation, yeah. right? And I think about this a lot when I go to Europe, when I have like books and stuff there, right? Where, you know, it's, you know, how much time do I spend apologizing for the, you know, over a million people we you know, killed in Afghanistan. You know, how much do I spend time, do I spend talking about, you know, the drone, uh, US, the drone program in Yemen, right? Uh, the answer is very little, right? Uh, occasionally you're asked about it, but this is a person who felt that, um, that there was a, a moral, um, the, you know, that, that he had a, a moral responsibility to, um, to keep on. And he might, uh, uh, and to continue. And I think he might have inf conflated writing with talking to high school students, with getting together with a friend and talking on the phone, and you know, all elements of diffusing his personality. But I think he felt this responsibility. And um, I don't feel a responsibility like mm -hmm. that. Um, I think that most you know, writers who, who are sane <laughs> don't, right? Most writers who are my yes. friends don't. Um, and so in a way, even though it makes me not want to spend so much time with him, I respect that you know, someone like that must exist. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to address the, we're going to end with a beautiful uh, clip. But before that, I want to address that, mm -hmm. as we called it in our conversation before, the dark elephant in the room, which mm -hmm. we already hinted at, which was, his nothing short of obsession mm. with diaspora Judaism 
and his, his need to explode everything and, and bite hands that brought him and really be very obnoxious. And my relationship with him, my personal relationship started with a huge fight. <laughs> well, we're Israelis, so that's how we do it. No. <laughs> uh, but like we were in Mishkenot Anim, he was hmm? sitting with a very uh, well-known American, female American author that hmm. will remain unnamed, Nicole Krauss. And uh, he was, uh, and uh, she was, uh, of course, charming and wise as she always is. And he sat there and in the big tent in Mishkan or Chananim and just started the horror show. Mm -hmm. You guys and, you, da, da, and you're not authentic and you will never. Now, I was in the audience uh, some 15 or 18 years into my life in, in the US. So by now I'm already a hybrid, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I was horrified. I was I couldn't I couldn't tolerate this. This is like an ex elder or elder of my ex tribe or an elder of my mm -hmm. tribe, a, a behaving in a, in a very tribal and obtuse way. And I then like couldn't hold. I wrote this very obnoxious. I must confess, <laughs> op ed that Haaretz of course ran to publish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, he became very offended, and it was a terrible thing. And then uh, at some point, he wrote to me, and he, he said, I think it's time we met and clarified things. I was like, okay, wow. Aleph Bet Yeshua. Now it, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't into mm -hmm. And And it's like, okay, the guy from The Lover wants to clarify. It was, yeah. it was this disconnect between Aleph Bet Yeshua mm -hmm. and that crazy old Zionist sitting okay. on the stage. And then we met, and he could not have been more charming right. and generous and, um, and, uh, and giving. And it was such a strange thing. And at the same time, I think that his ideas about Jew Jewishness, and, and I spoke to him two weeks before his death, mm -hmm. and he was like still thinking that it's time to give up on, di on, on the diasporic Judaism, and now we have to like make the Arabs, the Palestinians, whatever, they, into the new Jews. I said, Bully, you became a Canaanite? He's like, I am not a Canaanite. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, okay, okay, you're not a Canaanite. But um, so how does it make you, us, feel about, about this idea of like the negation of the diaspora? Do you feel that this is is still Israel, or he's still a, a voice of Israel, or he's something old and irrelevant? Yeah. I'm sorry, am I, am I no, just... No, I'm just no? interested to hear more about your experiences, because that's like a, okay. like a kind of front row seat to something I did not have a front row seat to. Okay. I mean, I can't help but... You're lucky. Like, uh, it I mean, wasn't yeah. pretty. It was but not I do pretty. Have to, I do have to say, I have often wondered, what has it been like for quote-unquote, frontline Israeli leftists to sort of have this experience again and again from these Americans who pay their taxes to the American government that does all these mm. atrocious things, and then they're treated as if they're sort of totally unwelcome at this festival and that festival, and yeah. nobody wants... So I sort of feel like I wonder if that has part something to well, do with it, yeah. with that hostility mm -hmm. and kind of derangement of reason, if it has to do with the derangement of reason that's brought to the table by by American Jewry, who like, of course, like, you know, are part of the tax paying system that manages the Israeli government, basically. So mm -hmm. I've always been curious, like, Interesting. why, what is that like on the other side? What is it, what is it like to feel like I am a citizen in this country and these people from this other country who I have a connection with are always telling me what to do and actually are instrumental financially to my na I, I just do think it's a very messy, horrible, ugly, under, and if any, there's nothing under investigated in the American-Israeli relationship, but I think this is mm -hmm. under investigated in the American-Israeli relationship, Fresh. which is that the, uh, Americans in many ways run mm -hmm. that policy. I mean, for me, I'll just say something that I, I figured out, I think I figured it out, I'm telling myself I did, with, with this last book that I wrote, which is that really, f I don't want to say the only way, the best way for me, I don't know, to write about my own culture is to write about someone else's. Mm -hmm. And I'll even go even farther, the best way to shit on my own culture is to shit on someone else's. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, entirely in my mind a literary mechanism. It's, it's um, if, if you change, you play Mad Libs and you change the, you know, the nouns, 
in a lot of his critiques about American Jewry, he is actually mourning um, in intellectual cosmopolitan and secular Israeli state. And uh, it's far easier to do that when they're putting you up on Fifth Avenue yeah. and they're buying you dinner and they'll take any shit from you, you know, um, than it is to do that back in Israel where that doesn't pay anything. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> Um, we got some questions. Yeah. Can somebody with a better accent than mine read them? I don't have a better accent, but I don't yet have corrective lenses, which I'm bragging That's about. A lot. I'm about That's to a get lot. them. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk more about Hamatzav, the Israeli condition, and how it manifests in literature? Mm. Hamatzav, though. I feel like you're Hamatzav. A kibush. <laughs> yeah. a kibush. A kibush. A kibush. Is the new matzav. name Hamatzav. Ah. Used to be Hamatzav. Now it's a kibush. Okay. kibush. okay. And okay. soon we'll see. So Hamatzav is an Israeli. <laughs> Hamatzav, the the condition, uh, is an old Israeli term for, like the the news and and are we gonna survive the news? This was like a time where every time there was news, everybody would stop, and would listen intently as if their whole existence, which, I guess was, uh, hangs on every word of these like fake accents fake Hebrew accents of the Shadranim when I was little. And, and it was as if there was an alternative reality that was as, o, o, as solid, almost tangible, as like the street we saw, which was called Hamatzav. And I feel that, uh, that I will call him bully, fine. I liked him and now he's bully. Um, bully became an, an embodiment of Hamatzav, for better and for worse. It, it took over his life. He really felt that he had to be the, the, the speaker of it. Uh, and, and so th there, was th there was the world, and there was the everyday, and there were like the inner workings of a, of a marriage or this and that. But there was always in the background an, an, another reality hmm. that was called Hamatzav, in which you had to discuss the, you know, it's not, it's beyond politics. It's like Israeli metaphysics. It was really a metaphysical, and I think Josh, you uh, you referred to it in 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 like your early uh, thing of like as f that's that's what it it yeah. you remember those days <laughs> very well. I mean, yeah, I I don't you know I, I mean so I'm going to speak for all Mizrahim. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> we uh, just discovered Josh's Yemenite yeah, roots right. and. No. I mean, you know, th there is an element. It's, listen to the white guy, on this, right? Yeah. You know, right. <laughs> so, you know, it's like there's an element where he is playing. You know, he is coming into an entirely Ashkenaz literary culture, mm -hmm. right? And he Perfect. and he's Moroccan, right? And or his mother. Ask, was, ask him for a second opinion. Ask him for a second opinion, right? And there is this idea of like anyone who comes into a world like that, where it's you know you want to represent your people you're from, but you want nothing to do with them at the same time. And there's always this sense then that you have to be, just like the Jews in Germany, had to be better Germans than the Germans. Mm. You know, he had to be a better Ashkenaz than the Ashkenazim. A better Sabra, a better, yeah. Yeah, and there was absolutely in my mind, there was this sort of, you know, I, I understand what these Ashkenazim do, and I've studied this, and I can do it better. And, and I, I, I really read a lot of his, um, the necessity of always having that, that backdrop, right? I mean, and, and, and the way you're describing it, I think, is it, it's, always that, it's, it's always the hum in the background of yes. everything. You know, it's like someone just can't show up somewhere because they want to. They had to show up there because of something geopolitical. And, very and, important. Yeah, very important. And so, you know, a, 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 a you know, it's, it's the cleaning lady, or it's the you know, guy on the street who's playing violin, right? It's, he, that person is the end point of a historical process, almost like a, like a naturalist novelist of, 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 of you know, the 19th century. And so um, I do think that that was his real attempt to, um, to do the novel in the way that he thought it was done by a cosmopolitan. And I think he, he overdid it. Because as we all know, novels are really just 
you know, written by uh, savages. <laughs> I agree. Um, how much of the essence of any writer is lost in translation? And given the extraordinary uh -huh. complexities of the Israeli experience um, and the newness of modern Hebrew, is it even more inaccessible to outsiders? It's an interesting Ooh. question. I think the answer is uh, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> all and nothing. I think all and nothing is a good answer, right? Uh, in, in a way, in a way, yes, a lot is lost, everything is lost, but I think in, in prose less so than in poetry, which in poetry is really just a damn right tragedy mm -hmm. to translate. And also it depends who's the writer. And I feel that with, with uh, Yoshua's writing, I feel that his writing was, especially as, as, it became, as it became further from that big bang of the inception of his, of his work, it became less about language and, and, lingu and stylistic gestures and became more about hamatzav and about ideas. And ideas are a, a easier, a to easier to translate, easier to translate um, than, uh, than real, like the subtle, the subtle stylistic gestures of the beginning. Um, and again, I, I mean, having, having read you guys, in, in Hebrew and in English. I think that a lot is preserved with the right translator. And then again, there's something lost. I mean, how do you guys feel about you? You, you know yourselves in a, in a translation? I mean, the thought of it? You know, it's funny because I, I, my most recent novel is basically like in German, except I wrote it in English. But um, all <laughs> the characters are living in sort of Germany in 1618, and they're speaking in German, and they're being on trial, and all of these things. And, uh, and, and the main character is illiterate. And I remember feeling just like, thank God I'm not writing this in German. Because if I wrote it in German, it would, I would feel weird modernizing it. And it seems mm -hmm. essential to me that it was a modern novel. So sometimes I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I mean, I think that's the magic of Hebrew is that it's this like, I mean, I think about my own, I do think about my own family, all of whom kind of Hebrew was their fourth language. And I, I just think that there's something like wonderful about kind of pigeon everything. And that there's, and um, I don't know, I just think it's sort of usually, hopefully, is interesting. I, th I, I have not read Yehoshua in Hebrew. I'm ashamed to say I'm one of those people who sort of was raised in the 70s and their parents told, their parents were told, don't, don't let them speak another language because they'll be mentally retarded. That was like the message at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I feel, I will say that when I read him in English, I know that I'm missing things. But it's a, it is like remarkable to me that there's something like kind of slightly, especially because he's, he's basically interested in serial subjectivity and, and um, or like the novels that I've connected to are a sort of serial subjectivity. And th there's something beautiful about reading these language, you know, there's almost always, most of the characters, whether it's a woman in Jerusalem or whether it's the lover, a lot of these characters are not functioning in their first language. So if anything, uh -huh. I feel like for him, it's maybe more powerful than it would be for some people. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a really lovely point of just that so many of his characters are, you know, are not masters of the language in which they're described. Yeah. And that's, and there, there, so there's, there's both this weird alienation, but also this, uh, 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 an alienation of, of, a, of, of a character um, from their description, let's say, yeah. or their ability to talk from their, from their description. But, um, but then again, you know, in, 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 in my little experience reading, reading Yoshua in, in, in Hebrew, which I, I did, and then I said, oh, you know, I don't know that I'm missing so much. You know, you um, you, the, uh, the writers, for example, of... Um, you, you know, two writers that I, I saw once sit at a table together, and they could not be, and I, I you, you'll know better, I, I don't know, you, I was still at the age where everyone in their, like, 80s kind of is the same age, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. <laughs> you mean everyone and in their 50s days. Yeah, 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 that's what yeah. I meant, right. right now there. But it was, you know, it was um, uh, Joel Hoffman mm -hmm. and, and, and Joshua. And, you the, know. The most... Right. Polar opposites. Polar opposites, but they, but they both have to eat. Yeah. Okay. And it was lunch. Okay. At, and it, this was at Mishkanot. And, and they spoke? And no. They, uh, not at yeah. all. Not at all. And, 
And, you know, Hoffman, whom I love, um, and I, I truly consider to be, you know, I mean, I feel his writing, I think, more directly and intimately than I feel Yoshua's. Mm. He's someone, because his Hebrew is just made of so much Russian and Yiddish and Hungarian and stuff I think he just makes up. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and you know, Zen koans, because he's also a, a you know, translator from, from, I believe, Mandarin and Japanese. And, you know, and, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that, um, that if you don't read it in Hebrew, you know, you're completely, you, you know, then you haven't read it. But then when you read the version that Peter Cole does in English, because Peter Cole, I mean, it's a totally different book and it's yeah. beautiful in its own way. With, with, with Yoshua, I think that what he was looking for was w what a lot of, I think, Israeli writers, especially of that famous triumvirate, because we've gone this far without saying the word Oz. Yeah. Right? Wow. It's amazing. Wow. It's like a drinking game. Now wow, you have yeah. to drink, right? <laughs> um, you know, the, the one of them who was canceled, right? Uh -huh. Right. That's why we can't, right? <laughs> and so, but, but, you know, part, being part of that, you know, three tenors, very male triumvirate, right? Because we can't say Trinity, you know, um, it is, uh, I think that, that all three of them were really looking for a um, sort of what every, you know, writer kind of looks for, but not in a national political sense, which is what is the register at which we write our books? You know, I mean, Rivka wrote a, a really a, a beautiful book that has all of these contemporary political resonances, but, but is set in, in the Middle Ages in Germany, you know? And, um, and, you know, I wrote a book that, uh, 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 that absorbs a lot of different kind of language stuff, but it's set in, in, in 1959, 1960, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, uh, and I wasn't there. Uh, don't let the beard fool you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but to write about the present and to write about, so, you know, throw out the word matzav or whatever, but to write about the present, to write about your time, and to write about your time in your language that has been very recently codified, and to try and find a basic register for the writing of novels, is um, it, it, it's an amazing place to be, and it sets the styles that are then reacted against by other generations. We are close to the end of our time, but actually um, part of what was brought up is a great transition into um, this other question that came in from the audience. Is there a fine line for Israeli authors who want to be published in the West in terms of how they have to talk mm -hmm. about Israeli politics yeah. here? Tell the yeah. truth. Uh, <laughs> ah. I think the answer again is yes. No? Yeah. It's very I positive. Think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think that there, there, is, there is a certain uh, expectation for Israeli authors to do like a certain gesture of self-flagellation about Hakibush, which mm -hmm. is a new word for Amatzav, mm -hmm. and those who want to be successful abroad uh, often find a uh, sometimes more elegant, sometimes less elegant way of doing it. Mm. And yes, it's hypocritical. It mm. is, and uh, and and yet this is a, it's a reality. Mm. Now I don't think that actually Bully mm. was part of this game. I think he just was so authentic, again, for better or for worse. Right. He was really, it really stemmed from him. So when he, he spoke in the clip we saw before, and we will end with another short clip, about his love of the Arabs that his father used to bring home, yeah. I think he had actually a genuine love of Arab culture and, and of Arabs yeah. that was not mediated through politics and like the condescending approach of politics to, right. to, to the Palestinians, but actually he really felt close to them. So I actually think he, with his famous authenticity, yeah. managed to maybe escape this. Others, not so much. Huh. Yeah. And we'll leave it at that, I think. Yeah. Should we watch the last little clip? Yeah. Because it's yeah. very beautiful. Yeah. And then thank our wonderful audience here. עד גיל 18 לא ידעתי אפילו אם אני אהיה סופר. אפילו לא חשבתי שזה מוכרח להיות. אני קיבלתי בחיבור בשביעית, והראיתי את זה לילדים לפני כמה זמן, קיבלתי לא מספיק. והייתי ממש שלילי בחיבור. שלילי בחיבור, לא רק כמעט טוב. ופתאום הרגשתי כנראה דרך באבא בשמינית את אותה תחושה של 
המגע עם החומר הזה, כמו שאדם נוגע במוזיקה, כן? נגעתי במילים ודרכם באתי לספרות. I think it's such a, it, this is such a, a captivating, such a, a, an endearing quote. I think it really catches a certain humility that under all of this, there was a certain humility and the, the famous honesty. And, and uh, this, you know, we, we, we pointed out at many things today, but at the, at, I think at the bottom line, there really was a very authentic, honest man who who gave his life to Hebrew literature and Israeli literature and Israeliness, and also to the great liberal ethos of the world that we still associated Israeliness with. Mm. And I, I will miss him. Yeah. I, I will miss him. Yeah. You know, the, the, the last thing, you know, he, he said, I think I've said this at another thing, but because it was right after uh, uh, I met him, and you were saying, you know, he has this, he represented a certain cosmopolitan liberalism, you know? Yeah. And um, we were talking about some other subject and we were talking about something how, you know, it was difficult to, writers weren't as influential as they used to be and maybe that world had ended or something like that. And he said to me, you know, Afilo uh, Shoah, even the Holocaust ended. <laughs> 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 And you know, and that to me will always be in, in, in my ear in his in his voice. You know, it's it's even even the Holocaust ended. It's like, um, and I do feel with his departing, like it is really, um, and and with all's gone, you know, it's and and Grossman just this last, you know, I feel like yeah. there should there should be like an EKG heart meter that goes to Times Square that just has David Grossman's, you know, cardiac. Whatever, we'll tell him, we'll tell yeah, him. because because it really does mark you know the end of a really certain era, yeah, and um and one that that to you know to kind of grow up and, and having seen that right above you and then having seen it you know from outside of it, um however much it it it, it you know there are things that are bothersome or disagreeable or whatever it it um it, it it's a miracle, yeah. in a way. Wonderful way to end this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you.